All right, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Jason Michaels TV, episode five. I'm Jason Michaels, and we are live streaming straight from Nashville, Tennessee. This is the show that combines inspiration and amazement, and we hope that you are having a beautiful Friday afternoon. I'm very excited because I have one of my best friends uh, in the world uh, on today's show. We've traveled around the world together uh, entertaining people. He is a very talented comedian and magician. He also has a very powerful, inspiring story uh, that he shares, uh, I don't know, over a hundred times a year in front of different audiences. It's both inspiring and motivational. And uh, his name is Stephen Bargatze. In a second, I'm going to bring him on. But before we dive into that, I thought I would take the opportunity to uh, kind of introduce you to his style of humor and his style of magic. Um, so uh, about five or six years ago, Stephen and I had the opportunity to go on a tour overseas uh, and do some shows with the military. It was the way that we both got introduced to it uh, firsthand. And he and I have traveled uh, all over the world since then uh, and, and done this. And so I'm going to share a video clip with you. It's a, about two minutes long video clip. It just really gives you an idea for his style of humor. This was at a show that was performed uh, in Central America. I haven't talked to my armed forces people, so I don't know how much I can say about where we were. I'm sure it doesn't matter, but I'm just going to say generally where we were so you can get an idea. Uh, and so I'm going to share that with you right now. Uh, sit back, relax, and laugh because he is going to uh, he's going to have some fun with you. <laughs> This is not the first time you wore one of these. <laughs> I don't concentrate on your card. You make sure it hooks up right. Mr. Color, do you have it? Let me get it. <laughs> I'm sure it over. <laughs> Stephen Bargatze, let's bring him into the uh, screen. Hey, man, how you doing? All right, that brings back some memories right there. I bet it does. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Um, you, I think I have heard you talk to other magicians because you're a com like you kind of have like the, the trifecta going on. So you're a comedian and you're you are genuinely 
funny. I mean, you don't have to do magic to be funny. I've seen you do, mm -hmm. do comedy. You're a magician. Yeah, looks, you're looks are not everything, you know, Jason. Sometimes What's that? Like, What'd you say? Looks can't be everything. Sometimes looks can't be, That's right. Exactly. But you're also a magician. And you're not just a magician. You're a magician who, like, what, what year was it? In 2000, 2001, you won the close-up competition at the International Brotherhood of Magicians uh, International Convention. Yeah, a uh, big major competition that all magicians have uh, so that we can give each other awards. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so, but uh, no, it's a pretty, it was a big honor and, and uh, distinction to win that. And I won it in the year 2000. Uh, you know what? I I like growing up. I mean, I like uh, like Carl Valentine and mm -hmm. uh, I like there's some, there's some people that out there that used to make fun of magic. And uh, and now I thought they were great. They were really funny where the magic trick never worked. And I always liked that. The amazing Jonathan was that way a lot mm -hmm. in his early years. But I, I wanted to, uh, to have good magic. I also wanted him to laugh and think this guy may be nuts. But <laughs> I don't know how he did that. <laughs> so at right. the end, they see that the whole show itself was a trick onto them. That, you know, I'm not really the nut or the idiot that they think I am. Yeah. But you know, what's funny is that, so you have comedy and you have magic and they're both strong, like really strong. So you could, you can do either, but you combine them to really make an impact. But you also, and we'll talk about this more in a second, but you also have a powerful story that you go out and speak to how many groups do you speak to every year? Over a hundred, don't you? Yeah. The, in Tennessee, I do around 130 a year. And plus outside of Tennessee, I probably do another 40 or so, so where I'm just doing the speaking only. Yeah. Uh, I'm not only with magic and speaking and uh, plus also I still do my regular show and uh, now I've got this thing with this new comic I'm working with him some and uh, but other than that uh, this new comic who's this, yeah who's this new comic uh, Nate Bargetsy I've been doing oh. <laughs> stuff with him. So I yeah. just, he only allows me one trick because it uh, I don't do anything fast it takes me 10 to 12 minutes just to do one effect. Okay. Yeah. But well, you say it takes you 10 to 12 minutes to do one effect, but that's when you count in all the laughs that you get. And I've seen you one trick, one effect for you is like five different tricks. Like you combine a lot of stuff in so that they're getting a lot. You may say, Oh, it takes me 10 minutes, but in that 10 minutes between the laughter and all the magic they get, there's a lot going on. Yeah, actually. And, uh, just one trick I know that I do, uh, the cup of cup and ball trick, what I called it. It has seven different effects in it, seven magical effects that are different from each other, all in that one effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's always been my uh, thing that I think that's what makes me maybe different than some other guys and stuff. I try to cram a lot of different magic happening all the time. Yeah. Uh, but so that's just who I do, what I do. But with so, my son, I'm only doing, I do one, but again, it has about four things in it. So it's interesting. I, I have uh, told people this and I will stand by this and I don't, I, you didn't know I was going to say this, but I think you're perhaps one of the most underrated comedy magicians around. Like I've seen the magicians that they say are the top comedy, like this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy are the top guys in the industry. Uh, Steven, I've seen you play every type of venue imaginable. I have been with you, uh, in the, to do military shows overseas. And sometimes that means you're in a big theater. And sometimes that literally means you're in a lunchroom. I've seen you work for youth audiences of uh, teenagers and young adults. I've seen you work uh, in theaters. I've seen you work for big giant, huge. I mean, I've seen you in every setting, no, under any circumstance. And you have consistently, every single time you have absolutely crushed. Uh, and it's interesting because not everybody can do that. You have a unique style where you break down the barriers with the audience. So let me, let me just give you an example. So when we went to Iraq in 2015, one of the interesting things to me was that these men and women, they have up 
they have a guard up. They have a mental guard up because they're like, it's, it's no joke what they're doing. They're like in a war zone or they're getting ready to go to a war zone. They're doing serious stuff. And so when they come to a show, number one, they want to have fun. But a, but a major part of that is they have to figure out how to take that block, that guard off. And I saw you break through that over and over and over again and allow them to just feel it, to it, to laugh, to enjoy, and just feel like humans again. So I think you're one of the most underrated, and I think you can hold your ground against any comedy. Not that it's a competition, but I think you're as good as any comedy magician there is. Well, uh, it's not a competition at all, and uh, and and I can we can both name two dozen other guys that are just as good, like David Casaros and Rick Merrill and all those guys. I had to. But uh, you have to drop that. You have to do some name dropping. <laughs> no, but uh, no, but those uh, I do have the different experiences. I have done it all. I've done a funeral. I actually had to go to a funeral, and uh, with the guy laying right there behind me, and the family asked me to do magic, and and uh, so I, there's Ooh. nothing that I haven't not tried. <laughs> <laughs> One time, I did card to pocket with the guy in the casket. The, <laughs> this is such a weird story, but but this guy was a very good friend of mine. He was a member of our magic club, and his family he loved magic, and it was what he was all about. And they just had a private little family thing before anything else, and they just wanted to get together, and they wanted me to do some tricks in his honor. And okay. uh, I got there, and when I got there, the family was in the back getting prepared, and I was just in the room with him. And uh, uh, I thought, well, you know, I need, I don't know if I would do it or not, but I took a card and put it in his pocket in his little suit coat there. Wait, said, wait, wait, you're talking about the guy in the casket? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> just in case, I just thought, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know how they would really take me or if this were just going to be, they stare at me, but they had a ball right from the beginning. It was just, they, so I knew I should go for it. A guy took a card and I, it vanishes from the deck. It's gone. And I had him to go pull it out of the grandfather's pocket. And there it was. They went crazy. It, oh. it killed. Oh. Literally. <laughs> but, um, so I can say I bet very few people have done that. I also got to do one with you with uh, the guys. in. The, uh, I think we were in Iraq with the, the bomb. Was that Iraq or Kuwait? Which, which one are you talking about? With the bomb uh, machine that, that did this armed bomb, bombs. That was in Kuwait. In Kuwait. Yeah. We go in there and they have, these are the guys that go in and take, you know, when they find a, uh, a bomb on the side of the road, this thing goes in this machine and takes it apart. And so they put, so this guy showed us how he opens up a brief uh, backpack and he was able to get some stuff done with this, you know, quarter of a, three quarters of a million dollar machine. And then in the meanwhile, while that was happening, Jason gets in the box, gets in the outfit. I'm not strong enough to stand up. I would have been like a turtle. Oh my God. <laughs> but Jason gets in and they don't think he can get up, but he, he was able to stand up in it. But while he was doing it, nobody noticed that I was talking to the, the guy controlling the little the robot. And when they came back and it was my turn to do a trick, we had that with the robot actually find somebody's thought of card and went and picked it up off of a ping pong table and raised it up. It was, I just, it's, it kills me that we didn't film this thing, but it was, oh. it was the most expensive trick I've ever done. Yeah. The, the three quarters of a million dollar card trick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I got a picture of it, but that's it. And unfortunately mm -hmm. we didn't, we didn't know we were going to talk about it or we could have shown that picture. Yeah, we yeah I should have I should have put that on here. I do have actually a couple of photographs. Let me share the screen. We'll take a quick peek at some of these photographs. Here's a photo of you wearing a that looks like your <laughs> that does not look like something you want to see when you're uh, getting ready to when you're flying in an airplane. Why are you wearing a? Yeah, are we not allowed to say where we were going? Yeah, you can say. Yeah, I think it's fine. We were going to get Mo uh, on the way there, and you had to get on a little small plane and hit some turbulence or something that caused all those to fall down yeah. so it was, it was it was quite thrilling and yeah. uh, unlike yeah. the rest of you guys i put mine on i take no chances yeah you know, <laughs> he goes that that wasn't supposed to happen okay. so here i got a couple of photographs of uh, we're in africa here and uh 
I, I, number one, I was looking for a photograph because like I said, we find ourselves in all sorts of different uh, situations as far as different styles of performance. And this is interesting to me because we were in this little, basically a restaurant, uh, the picture on the left, where I ended up doing uh, table magic for the entire group. And you did a combination of magic on the table and stand up magic. Um, and then uh, in the same country, we've got uh, you really enjoying your meal uh, right, yeah. right there on the right. Because you know, I know you love eating uh, food that you're unfamiliar with. You know, uh, all I noticed is in uh, that restaurant, uh, th there was a lot of cats. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't seem like so many cats after they served the meal. So oh, I, was yeah. little, and I never saw any cows or anything like that in that whole country. I'm going, where, what are we eating here? It did not taste right good. I mean, bless their hearts. And I ate it to be polite, but you can see I'm thinner than I've ever been in a long, long time. Uh, but what was really cool, cool about that place was um, some place in Ethiopia when we landed there, uh, that was the first time we I, we got to use like have a real bathroom instead of that little hole in the ground. Mm. And uh, I was so excited, but then I couldn't even eat eat the meat. So then we have to the family have to want to use the bathroom. You're killing me over here. You know what? But something very very important happened to me right there. I don't know if you remember that. I don't know why we're talking about all this, but it's okay. Give it to me. We went into town and uh, with the soldiers the next morning, and this was nothing. Oh, yeah. Different. And um, again, we have pictures of this, but so they go on there and they said, we're going to meet a lot of people and stuff like that and kids and things. And whatever you do, you're not to and you talk to them and stuff like that, but don't give them anything. Don't give them money or something like that. And I had this one little boy that just really I just kind of fell in love with him and they followed us around. And I mean, there would be people come around and even hit the kids away from you with sticks because they said they're just beggars and everything. And um, uh, I thought I knew better than the soldiers. And when we were leaving, I just went up and shook this guy's hand, this little boy's hand and hugged him. And I, and I gave him some money and um, American money. I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is more than what they make in a, the family could make in months. Yeah. And, uh, and I just walked away. And when I got into the car, the little boy pulled it up and opened it. In front of everybody. In front of everybody, because he didn't know what it was. And he got some kid immediately hit him right in the face. And another, they all jumped on him. And they tore the money up fighting over it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, it, it, I got yelled at by the, the, <laughs> the sergeant kid. really. I deserved all of it. You know, I thought, I thought I was helping and yet I didn't know. I don't, I, I didn't understand what was going to happen, but I never made that mistake again. But it was, it was life changing. Yeah. Me to, so, you know what, you, that, uh, there was how long was that? You, there was a period of two, three years after that. You because we uh, got to go around town with a, a priest uh, who was yeah. there, uh, in there completely separate from the military. He was there, uh, right. station there, and um, and you kept in touch with him and sent him. Uh, yeah, my office. Uh, I work with the with the team. My office is at the T Tennessee Secondary School Athletic Association, yep. and uh, me and a couple of the ladies there. We started because we could buy clothes that uh, from yard sales and stuff that they and and there was two women there that we gave them food, the the clothes and shoes and stuff to sell. They really liked children's clothes and baby clothes because this lady would sell it. And these were women who had AIDS or their, uh, you know, their husband had died of AIDS. So they were just trying to support their family mm -hmm. and we were able to send them. It would cost, uh, you know, the box itself to send the box was about 150 bucks, you know, and the lady wasn't going to make 10, $20 off of it. But, but that's uh, $20 is enough for, yes. month for a month. Yeah, and we did that for almost two years until uh, the the priest got sent out, and then another priest came in, and uh, he did, he just he didn't he didn't have the contact with those women and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that kind of just fell through for a while. So and, uh, one of the one of the interesting things that happened on that this the very first trip that you and I did 
that the what this adventure that you're talking about was on that very first trip but at the very 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 beginning of the trip a very important thing happened that i think i remember when it happened thinking to myself well this is really not good but then i remember thinking afterwards i thought this could end up potentially being really good for steven he's not going to like it but by the end of this tour oh, he didn't like it so tell us tell us what happened when we flew into Africa and you went to get your luggage. First of all, we flew in a little town called Djibouti. Djibouti. <laughs> Djibouti. And the coolest thing about that is you get to say the word Djibouti. Right, right. And uh, just to never say it, when you get off the plane, you're going in, there was hanging gallows right outside the airport. Yeah, the, the prison you know, is right outside the airport. Yeah. They basically just uh, execute people in broad daylight. Yeah, and uh, that had happened about a week before they said before we got there, and uh, so we get there, and I had two suitcases. One was uh, some of my stuff uh, that in a carry on, and but my main bag with all the stuff that I do, the plungers from that trick and and everything was all was not there. And uh, we we spent about two days, two and a half days there, and they kept thinking it would show up. It never it never did come. And then when they eventually found it, we were already gone by that time. In the we had already been to Africa and Kuwait, and the bag uh, I wouldn't get my bag for three and a half months. And uh, I learned a very valuable lesson. Number one, don't pack very valuable things in there. I packed some one of the kind items in there that yeah. I would never going to get again. So I thought it's in some cave now and I'll never find it. But the, the, the Air Force and the or they were very great and they got me my bag three and a half months later. But everything was in it uh, and stuff. But it forced us to just go on the fly and make up a show. I We went to the PX. I just bought some cards. And of course, you can buy plungers. And uh, but we just put some stuff and Jason was was very good and kept telling me that now yeah, you're going to do it. You can do this. It'll be okay. Cause I had to do what? 30, 45 minutes. No, you had to do 45 minutes and you probably had 20, 20 to 25 20. minutes of material yeah. in your other bag. So, I mean, you lost, you, the, you lost 70% of your show, but you lost of the time that you had to do in front of an audience, it was about 50%. But right. the reason that I say that I thought it ended up being a good thing is I don't remember. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember that by the end of that tour, you it's you. I guess you already knew this, but it was almost like in my mind, you had to rely more on being funny as opposed to being a magician. And Stephen, you are a great magician. But if you ask me, I think it is more and, and you, you probably are going to disagree with me, but I have seen you all over the place. And I think the most important thing to you is to make people laugh because it creates this amazing feeling that they have. And, I, and it forced you to make people laugh more because you all you had was a few props and your words. And I at the end of that trip, your show was so comedy based. It still had great magic, but it was so based on comedy. It was it was really wonderful to watch because. I think it helped you recognize that you didn't really have to. And I mean, I know you do magic because you love it, but I think you just as well realized that you could stand up in front of an audience with no props and make people laugh. Yeah. Uh, I learned a lot about comedy during that time. I learned you have to take chances mm -hmm. you have to do things. I was saying and doing stuff that I would have thought I'd have never done. And uh, you have a great story on that. Uh, the, when we, I was it didn't, uh, Djibouti with the lady in the dress. The lady. Oh, you know what? Yeah, that's right. We do have us. Uh, we have, do I have, so no, I don't, yeah. So do you want to tell that story? I think you should tell the story because you know, let me set it up for you though. So our very first show was in Djibouti. We had two shows uh, and we get to Djibouti and Stephen has lost his uh, luggage and um, and we're just trying to figure out what we're going to do because we have to do an hour and a half long show. Each of us have to do 45 minutes. And uh, and I mean, I knew what I was going to do. Stephen had to figure out what he was going to do. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I so we had a uh, an escort with us. And one of the things that they said to us at the very beginning, they said, now, listen, um, just make you know, and we knew this. We had been warned ahead of time, but they just said just to just to reiterate 
just make sure you, you know, don't do anything too edgy with these, you know, don't do anything inappropriate. Don't make it, you know, don't make fun of race or color or sex or anything like that. And so it was just one more warning right before we, um, we go, go on the stage and, and, uh, and I was, and so I did my set and then Steven went on, I think, I, I think I went first and then Steven went yeah. on and, and I was standing next to our escort and, and Stephen had done 40 minutes, maybe 45. He was at the very end of his set. And then this happened. Do you want to tell it or do you want me to I keep going? Okay. And then, so he's done a killer 45 minutes. And, and, and it's it, the show has gone spectacularly, especially considering that he's lost his luggage. And uh, and he says, uh, and so then he starts looking and, and I mean, he's basically take, taken his bow and I'm just like, ah, oh, we killed it. And then he's, he keeps looking and he's looking and I'm standing next to the captain who was with us, the, our escort. And Stephen keeps looking at this lady in the audience, and she's the only person wearing a dress. Everybody else is wearing their gear or they're wearing workout clothes. But this one lady, she had basically wanted to have a fun night out and feel like she was going to an event. So she had done her hair. She had done her makeup. She had put on a dress. She just wanted to feel normal, just like she was at home. Stephen kept looking at her at the very end, and he goes, I'm, I'm so sorry, but... We've been traveling and I just, I'm just kind of missing home. Do you, uh, can I, can I just give you a hug? It's one of the best looking things I've seen in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I literally thought to myself, you just tanked us. I cannot believe after you crushed and did everything perfectly. How did you just, why did you cross the line? At which point she, she goes, yeah, it's okay. And Stephen walks towards her. And right as he gets to her, literally maybe two feet from her, she stands up, he pushes her back into her seat. I and turns to the, the side, she went, somebody caught her. And turns to this big giant soldier and goes, man, just give me a hug. And this dude jumps up out of his chair and gives Stephen a hug. And he brought the house down. It was fantastic well that goes back to taking chances and stuff like that because you know first of all when they say don't do anything that's like saying whatever you do don't look at the pimple on his nose <laughs> or, or, or the lazy eye don't look at it well of course you're going to look at it right so the, i have this lady down here and i know that i can't say a joke about her being all dressed up you yep. know and stuff and i'm the whole show I'm, I'm I'm having to think a lot because I'm doing stuff I haven't hadn't done. We just that we just made up, and then I'm also going. What am I going to do about this? I can't let her get away with just dressing up without getting some attention to her. And there was a big black guy right behind her that would just die and laugh in the whole time. So that was I go. This is perfect, and uh, it caught her such it caught her off guard. And, and I I remember her setting up. And then about the time I shoved her and she lost her balance and some guy caught her. So she goes flying sideways <laughs> and I grabbed that soldier behind her. It did bring the house down. And uh, I mean, we, you couldn't, you couldn't end it any stronger than you did. And I remember the captain was standing next to me and I was like, and I was like, I can't believe he's doing this. And he was like, Oh my gosh. And then you did that. And he, when we were both like, well, Steven knows how to walk that line and bring it back at the very last second. For sure. Uh, so, tell me what uh, I've got. A, I've got another cool photograph. A couple of photographs here. This was. Do you remember this show? This was when we we were in Iraq. We had been issued body armor, and we flew under cover of darkness on a Black Hawk helicopter to this little tiny base in the middle of nowhere. And this is you on stage performing there. And this is a photograph uh, to the right of us afterwards, after we had met everybody and shake it, shake people's hands and, and, and sign some stuff, giving some stuff away. Um, any, that, that was great. That's the 101st. Uh, no, it was the 101st, it was the 82nd, 82nd Airborne. Okay. I, yeah, this one was, but that yeah, it's a, a long picture then. I thought one time there was 101st was there, which is right by where we live. Right. So we went right. and got some pictures and, and uh, stuff on that, though. But uh, we had the same body, uh, the bodyguard that took us to all the shows. There was like five or six guys, and it was just like you're in the presidential thing. They would have a driver in front, behind, and a guy, and they would switch places. And so uh, 
it's uh, you you're way safer than I ever thought that you would think. I was wondering how they want to do all of this, but it only makes sense that they're going to make sure you're safe because yeah. if something were to happen to performers, then performers will quit coming. Oh yeah. And so so they treat you, and you got you get you get you feel very very safe. So uh, I have two final questions, and then we'll we'll quit talking about the military. We'll talk about another right. subject, but. Um, the two questions, I'll just combine them into one. Um, what do you think the hardest part and the most rewarding part of doing shows for the military are? What, to, to you, like, I mean, everybody's going to have a different answer, but what do you think the hardest part was for you? Well, just physically, because I, I mean, I'm 60 years old. I, I was not quite 60 when we went. Yeah. Uh, it's very and, demanding. You don't right. realize how physically demanding it's going to be. Right. And they kept putting you on the first floor and me on the second. And we would be so tired. Jason would just go, oh, you're going in and crash in the bed. And we'd have, they go, you got an hour and a half to rest. And it would take me the hour to get all of my stuff up into my room. Take a shower, and then have to carry it all the way back down. Because I couldn't just leave it out in the middle of desert or anything. Um, but um, don't I can't read things. Okay. That's all right. You don't have to read it. It's just up somebody to see. I hey Patty. But um I think you know the physical part of it was that the food you know in Ethiopia was just not my style. And uh but everywhere else I mean eating on the base was just like eating at Vegas, you know, at one of their bars or something. Yeah. So I thought the food was great uh yeah. and all that. I mean the best buy by, by far is the soldiers. Right. And um this is something that me and Jason we do once and sometimes twice a year, we do a show for all the prisoners here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. and there's a maximum security prison. And I always, I thought that doing prisoners and doing the soldiers show are the same. And uh, in that um, they have deja vu, you know, the groundhog day where they seem to be, their day becomes kind of like this quarantine. Every day is the same yeah. and you look for things to do. And uh, so when you have something, to look forward to it's really exciting so the guys the soldiers that came to our show they were excited to see a show yeah and i think number one they're pulling and they're hoping that you're good and they and they they're pulling for you so you so you know that's why i could take those risks and be able to, to do stuff they were wanting to laugh so mm -hmm. uh, and jason you know that because i i made jason work comedy clubs and uh even though you might not consider yourself a comedian in a comedy club you got more laughs and it just it just happens because people are there to laugh right. and they don't know you're not a comedian. Right. And so when they, you know, and it's the same kind of thing that happened over there mm -hmm. uh, for me, that just doing those soldiers and and meeting these. I mean, these seem how young the kids are and stuff, but yeah. they still just like to laugh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us. So we've got a couple of photographs here. One of them is a photo of our uh, poster. Uh, from a recent tour we did. Uh, actually, that's the poster we used when we um, when we did uh, Guantanamo and a couple of other bases. Um, right. And then we're to the left, the, there's uh, a photo. Magic with, with these couple, Christian and Catalina. Yeah. And we didn't really need Christian. We could have done it with the Catalina. She's the one with all the real powers. She's the yeah. mind reading. And she, there's something strange about her. But she's, I we don't even know why Christian came, but. Uh, <laughs> so tell me about the photograph on the left. I told you, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the, the broadcast that I've seen you in all sorts of different types of settings. And one of my favorite settings was, now granted, you and I have worked everywhere together and um, I've worked, I've had the opportunity to do a little bit of work with Nate, but when you and Nate were doing a specific show together, I said, I'm going to see that. And so there yeah i didn't know you were coming that was a big surprise I am, a, I am actually in that photograph too i'm just really 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 far <laughs> away in the audience so tell us about that yeah you didn't if you'd have told me i might have got you better seats <laughs> <laughs> what was that where was that what happened that was uh you know this is the first time uh for uh, a show that big almost it was 1400 people i believe uh that we worked i had worked comedy clubs with nathan and I had done some shows with Michael Finney, you know, with four or three or 400 people or something together with Nate. But this was, uh, Nate had sold out uh, the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas. 
and it was the week before Thanksgiving, and uh, the winds are, I don't even know, the weekend before Thanksgiving. And so he invited me uh, and our whole family. He, he, he's such a special kid. He, he paid for my, my daughters and my son, and all of them could, got to come if they wanted to come and uh, be a part of this. And uh, that was my first experience of just all the prior time in opening up for Nathan uh nathan became really big really quick he's he, you know he's been on the tonight show 12 times he had uh comedy central special he had two of those he had he had a netflix special uh called the uh the stand-ups he's on season one and people and so he, he, his fame is growing which is getting really big and and it wasn't until his one hour special called the tennessee kid that everything just blew up. So he went from selling one or you know, two shows a night, every night in um, comedy clubs to these big theaters. And that's what he's doing now. 1,200, 2,000 seats, places, and he's selling them out one, two shows a night sometimes in some cities and things. And um, prior to th that show, he never, he talked about me in his first album called Yelled At by a Clown. And this may be hard to believe, but I made this. <laughs> I used to be a clown. This is my, I don't know if I'm wearing it right. <laughs> this was my yo-yo the uh, clown. I just saw it right there. I got to do uh, a screenshot of that and say. I, I, I made this right here, so it's really good. That made but, out of um, so he did an album. That was his claim to fame, his first thing. It was a, the greatest title ever of a comedy album, Yelled At by a Clown. Yeah. And uh, but then his comedy is, you know, of course he got better and better. And, I mean, doing different things. He just wasn't talking about me that much. Yeah. And then, uh, so when I, when I worked with him a couple of times in clubs, people didn't know who I was and we didn't tell them. I would let Nathan tell them and they would love that once they found out. But in the beginning, they would just look at you like, who is this guy? Yeah. What is he doing? And, but then after the Tennessee kid, he talks about me again. And a big one of the big portions, one of the big jokes about his dad, the magician and stuff. So now they know that his dad's a magician. Mm -hmm. So when they when they when they say we have a special guest tonight, it's Nate's dad, they lose their minds. Mm -hmm. And I've done about eight of these since that one. And I'm telling you, they lose their mind every time. So I, I'm getting two standing ovations. I get one just for walking out. You know, just for not doing anything, <laughs> and uh, and th and then th I think they're just so glad to find out that wow, he's real. That he does do magic. And the next one is, oh, he's better than we thought. We thought he was going to be like watching somebody's uncle or something do or take his thumb off or something. We thought that's what we're going to be watching. Right, right. Uh, so they, th I think they just exploded because it's they, to them it was so good. Not only was it is he his dad, but he's really really good. And yeah. that picture there nate had it set up to do it and i didn't know he had had it done but uh he uh, uh had a photographer come around but he invited he said don't go i thought i was doing it because of my family i don't know but he invited me back out on stage for the and for that final goodbye for another uh big standing ovation from everybody and uh it was i mean it was just it's just one of those memories you never i'll never forget and it was just great John West says he needs a new mop head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, John, give me your address. I'll mail you one. I'll make you one. <laughs> Seems like I got a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. So let's let's shift gears a second. Yeah. I to, uh, I, we've talked a lot about the comedy and the magic. I want to talk about for a second something a little bit more serious. And uh, it depends. I'm going to let you guide this conversation as to how serious it gets, because at the end of the day, it is serious, but it's really an inspiring story. And that is the way that you go out and speak to different groups. And I know I've heard you. The easiest way to classify what you do is to say that you're a motivational speaker, but I've heard you often say, well, I like to think of myself more as an inspirational speaker. So um, right. just, you don't have to even talk about motivational versus inspirational, but tell us a little bit about, because I think what your, your personal story of growing up, I think all of that ultimately influenced 
your comedy, your 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 love. Uh, you know, it certainly you. I think you probably came with a sense of humor, but you know, your love of making people laugh. I think and, and magic as well. All that came because of your story. Do you want to share with us a little bit about that? Well, uh, yeah, well, you said a lot of nice things about me, Jason. Do you need to borrow money or something? Uh, well, you know, we can talk about that after we're done. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, my house growing up was very dysfunctional, and um, my father was a uh, was in Korea and and lost his eyesight and just drank a lot and. And bless his heart, he was just um, a guy who just had a lot of problems and didn't know how to handle it and stuff. And me and my mother never got along and, and ca caused a lot of problems. And I wasn't, a, you know, then I went through a period of my time when I was a teenager, I rebelled against them and I made their life miserable. And uh, but um, a lot of a lot of bad things happened uh, to me as a kid. And comedy was always it's just how we handle it. Me and my mom was really uh, uh, abusive to my sisters below me, and all of them that were all funny. Uh, I mean, that's how we handle it. We laugh, but we laugh when somebody falls down, and uh, as long as they don't die. I mean, we're just that kind of people. And uh, and my family, my kids are the same way. You know, Nathan makes a living doing comedy, but my daughter and my other son are very funny and their kids are funny and uh it just keeps going because that's how it's always been a part of our life mm -hmm. but uh when i was young nate i think you got this picture uh i was attacked by a dog and um uh, a bulldog bit me uh in the face and and he tore okay jason is making me sad uh no but he tore from here to here and he damaged my tongues muscles and stuff and um but I had plastic surgery for six years, the kind that makes you handsome. And um, <laughs> it worked. It worked. And they take skin from other parts of your body and they rebuild your face. Most of my face here, this is my butt. And um, it looks good. I just have bad breath a lot, but it looks oh, good. Oh, you're killing I'm sorry, me. I'm going into my story. Now, <laughs> yeah, here's what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I share with kids and young people and even adults uh, a serious story. But even then, I have to put laughter. You can't just, you know, be so sad when you're talking and telling your story. You have to release. You have to release your audience and let them laugh and let them know that look, this is okay. This is something that happened a long time ago, and I'm okay with it. I know I talk funny. I still talk funny. Mm -hmm. I was it was a lot worse when I was young, but I know I have a speech impediment, and there's words and sounds I can't say. And because of that, I had to take special ed classes and. I was called retard and stupid and all that stuff. And um, I ended up running away from home, just getting away from my house. They'd gone 12 years. But um, my father had called his brother. I was in a rehab uh, through drugs. And also I had tried to take my life as a teenager. And I was in a hospital rehab and my dad called his brother. And I didn't know this until at my dad's funeral. I found out that he called him and asked for help and he sent his son, Ron Bargetti, who was a, my cousin. And he came and he checked me out and said, hey, you're coming home with me. And he took me to his house and showed me normal. And what is a real life and families like to be like? Uh, I'm, I was used to being punched a hit and then anything if you did something wrong. And uh, one time I did something, I lied to him and his wife, Melinda, and she said, um, you know, she cried and she says, I can't believe you lied to me. And and as a, I was probably 18 years old and it, it crushed me. I couldn't believe I made somebody cry. And uh, so I, I knew I would never do that again. And the, uh, they got me to even go to school and go to college. I went to Trevecca Nazarene College. It took me 10 years because I was a special ed. But within 10 years, eventually he got me into college and I graduated in four. And, uh, and the magic. So my talk is I talk to kids just about overcoming these obstacles and, and not letting things get in your way. And and you can't live in the past. You know, I'm not going to blame my life on my parents or things. I, I had a lot of choices in them. My parents didn't make me not go to class and not do the work when I was young. I did all that dumb things. And uh, so I had to take responsibility for my own life and what I and the mistakes I made. Yeah. And then I had to try to improve it. Yeah. 
Well, and there's, there's no doubt, Jason, I don't always get to talk about this and I always do, but there's no doubt that God uh, played a major, major part uh, in all of that. Oh, are you going to ask me about that? All right. I get to talk about my faith. I didn't know I was going to say that, Dad. You didn't know I was going to ask about that. You're, we're, all, we're tracking, buddy. We're tracking. Okay. Sometimes we're not allowed to and everything. You know, you know what? We're, we're, allowed we're allowed to do whatever we want to do. Yes. Sometimes, you know, growing up with my the, the earthly father I had, he's not perfect. I'm not a perfect father by far. But uh, to, to find out that there's a heavenly father that loved and cared for me, I mean, that was just like the greatest message in the world. And I could never complain that he hasn't been there with me. I see things in my life now, looking back, that God was with me the whole time in my life. And he He took me out. And it was like Joseph. Um, and, and, and again, this is my favorite story that you tell. And I've heard you tell this before to different groups when you're able to, to, to tell it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the story of Joseph was showed by his brothers and sent down to Egypt. And then later God would use him to bring his family in. And, and he got, he grows to the highest thing. I was sent from my home. I ran away from my home. But the thing that got me is when I was a little kid, uh, I grew up Catholic and you have to have a confirmation name. And the third, second, third, fourth grade, I can't remember which, but, and uh, I didn't, wasn't really talking much to my parents. And so they didn't, nobody helped me with it. And so I, uh, I go to school and I find out, oh no, I got to, today's the day I'm meeting the bishop and I got to give him a name uh, and it's got to be a biblical name. And the only name I knew in the Bible was Jesus. And I was going, I don't think they're going to let me have that one. <laughs> um, so I'm standing there in the Catholic church. And I look up and there's a statue of Mary and Joseph. And I go, oh, I knew not Mary. I go, I'll be Joseph. So I, I the kid in front of me, he saw his pick on me. He said, what's your name? And I said, I'm going to be Joseph. And he goes, hey, you're stupid. You're just saying that because of that statue. And he was right. But there was a little nun there. And she said, you know what? There's two Josephs in the Bible. She was kind of defending me there. And I remember going, yeah, you know what? I was talking about that other one. I had no idea who the other one was, but you know what? God did. And uh, so it, it, to me, it was no mistake that that day I took the name Joseph as my Catholic confirmed name so that uh, when I read his story, I can see that mirroring in my life where God took me from, from where I was and chased me away from that and took me to another place but then later on i would be able to go back and reunite with my family and be with my brothers and sisters like i am today and even to get to reunite with my mom in the last four years or five years or so i've been able to reconnect with her and stuff so it's really been awesome and uh my faith is everything and and it, it goes all the way back to why we went why we do things for the troops and why we do things why i go to schools and why i do everything it's just tried to bring honor to him in some way. That's fantastic. That's, you know what? And I know that about you, but I think that it's good for other people to hear that uh, as well, because, uh, because we need that. And, and right now it's a difficult time. And sometimes we need to look beyond ourselves. I mean, we can certainly develop, you know, certain traits that maybe we need to develop, but we can look beyond ourselves for strength in other places. And so I'm so I'm thrilled that you wanted to go there. Oh, hey, look, Jay's uh, Jay is Jay Port. Hello from Greece. That's very cool. He's uh, wow. yeah, he uh, that was a trip that I got to make that you weren't able to go because you have all the programs that you do. You don't get to go to every single uh, armed forces. I didn't really want to meet Jay Port anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so here's the thing that most people don't know is that I wouldn't be speaking today to groups if, um, if it wasn't for you, I literally would not be, um, I, I had no interest. I have Tourette syndrome, which is a neurological disorder. And I met Steven years and years of years ago. And at some point in our relationship, uh, a number of years ago, probably 10 years ago or longer, he started saying, you know, you really should, you really should consider speaking about Tourette syndrome. And, and, and I had no interest, none. Like I, 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 in fact, I don't think you remember this, Well, maybe you do, but I remember very well saying, I don't want to ever talk about that. Don't bring it up again. And no, so I remember that more than once. Yeah. Because it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it was very embarrassing to me. Um, but you knew 
Yeah, yeah. Because, I think it's important. Why? Why do you felt embarrassed? Because I because Tourette syndrome, the way that it comes out, the tics, they're uncontrollable, rapid, repetitive movements. In for me, now some people have the vocalizations, and I've had those, but mostly it's movements. And so basically, what happens is. Um, I might be in public and I start having these twitches or these movements, these ticks, uh, and I and basically I don't have control over myself. And so people would look at me funny, and it would be it was just personally, it's just very embarrassing. I like to feel like I'm in control. I think most people want to feel like they're in control of themselves. And so the idea that I would stand up in front of an audience and admit that I have this thing instead of trying to, you know, I, there's probably. There's certainly, I'm sure there's some psychological reasons why I love magic so much. After all, I'm standing in front of a group of people showing you that I can do things that you can't do. I have the power and I, I try to make it as entertaining as possible, but that probably there's a little bit of me making up for the fact that at other times in my life, I don't have the power. I don't have the power and I'm just standing in front of people and they're making fun of me. So I didn't want to talk about it, but you were very, um, um, persistent in just little by little over time. And I'm talking about years and years and years and years and years, years, and years. six yeah. years, at least from the first time we talked about it. Cause I had to wait for you to forget about that. You told me never to talk about it again. <laughs> but right. I, I kind of gradually, I, you know, I knew that God wanted you to do this, that, that there's no reason I'm not saying God puts stuff on people like that. I'll make this guy have dress and this guy's going to talk funny and, and this guy's going to have weight. He, I, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that, that when we do go through some of these stuff and trials, that it's, it's who we are and dress is who you are. And I knew that God had you there for that. You had this for a reason. And the amazing thing about Jason is that we're watching him now and you don't see a lot of evidence of it. We right. should be with him in the middle of the uh, Iraq in the middle of the night <laughs> when nobody's looking and, and everything. And I, I used to think, how can this guy get any rest and any when he but when he's concentrating and working and performing? And that's how we met. I saw this kid with Tress and he's going through all of these rapid motions and doing it. And I'd never seen that before in my life. So I'm, I'm just thinking, what in the world is going on with that guy? And then. Uh, turned out you were on the magic show and you walked out and you were perfect. And I'm going like, well, what happened to that guy back there? And, um, and that's when I knew right then, I think God spoke to me or whatever. I don't know. I knew that me and you were going to be friends for life. Mm -hmm. And then the more I got to know you, I knew that you needed to be telling your story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I would sneakily, uh, <laughs> sometimes I had to pay you to come help me in the show. True. That's true. Actually, it was it was so funny because you would tell you told me, oh, I need somebody to come help me load my stuff in and 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 just help me set up because I'm going to be hurt. I'm going to be stretched for time and I need to be ready and blah, blah, blah. And I'll pay you a hundred bucks to come and set stuff up. And the simple truth was that may have been true once or twice, but no. six, yeah. eight, 10, 12 times. He just Stephen just wanted me to see what happens. I, th I think, and we can ask him, but I think what you wanted was you wanted me to see what happens when you connect with people in an audience in a different way that was past the magic tricks. And there's nothing wrong with magic tricks and comedy and entertainment is wonderful. It breaks down walls, but you wanted me to see how you were able to connect with people and really make an impact. Right. My, mine was no different than yours, other than, I mean, dressed and talking funny, but I... It was my weakness. It's what I felt like, you know, I know those words I can't say and I know I can't, I know I spit sometimes when I talk and I, I know that when every time I get up perform, I am potentially showing my weakness to everybody. Yeah. And uh, and that's where I felt like you were coming from and to, to admit to this and to see that, that you can use your weakness to reach people in a way that, that never did. And you wrote a book about it and it's, fantastic and i'm not just saying that because of you uh just a very well written book um you can talk about that and well i have it but it's somewhere over here i don't know i don't know i have it somewhere over here as well you know what though let's do this because we're talking about it. let's give people a let's let's show them you want to show them what it looks like i yeah i think you should all right let's show them what it looks like this is a video clip the of me from last year we were shooting some promotional material 
and um, the camera this, was just on and nothing was happening. This is so the camera was on and I was getting ready to shoot. And you're going to see the difference between what happens when I'm relaxed versus what happens when I'm on. And this is what it looks like. All right. Yep. All right, Jay. So uh, first of all, just sort of be like, hey, I'm Jason Michaels. You know, I've been doing magic ever since I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Just sort of give me a little bit. All right. a really short, like, little background. Yeah, you're not looking at the camera. You're looking at me. Right? Yeah, I'm Jason Michaels. I started magic when I was 16 years old because I wanted to learn a few card tricks. And now, look at this. It's ridiculous. Here we are uh, with a big magic show, you know, and uh, and it literally did sort of start off with something as simple as a magician. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, you know, the people don't even realize that it took me. It took us a while to get you to even show that because we were going like Jason. This is gold because right. Uh, that because that, that's the Jason we I see and I know and uh, yeah. that. It does show your weaknesses and, and stuff and, and a play for people go, oh my gosh, like when you're on the stage, they're not gonna see that. Yeah, it, there's a one of the things that I talk about in um in my talk is I just or actually in my book, I talk about something what that in your book is hyper focus, where it was just about being extra oh yeah, there you go. You can get the book on the website, jasonmagic.com. <laughs> The book is called You Can Do the Impossible Too. Actually, I wrote the book as the reason I wrote the book was because you had convinced me that I needed to start talking about it. And I knew that in order to do the best job that I could speaking, that I really needed to dive deep into the subject matter and think about all my stories. And so uh, it writing the book basically forced me to think about what it was like being a kid uh, and growing up with that. And then I wrote, a, I wrote a bunch of stories about magic adventures that I had had as well. But, um, but yeah, so yeah. Uh, that, that's what's so good about this. And uh, I'm a really good James Patterson. I like to read his books because yeah. you don't really know what's happening until the end. And each chapter makes you have to read the next chapter. And I don't know how Jason did it, uh, but he, copied that a perfect because it, I mean it's not an unbelievable thick book 200 less than 200 pages but uh, I uh, I thought I'll just read a little bit tonight and then go on and, and I ended up reading the whole thing in one night it just every chapter if you if you get this and you want to take a break you got to stop in the middle <laughs> don't go to the end because then something happens as you go well, well I got to find out what happens now how you get out of that but it's not it's also not all about Tourette syndrome it, it has that in its life of course but it's uh but it's it's about this underwater escape thing which is very dangerous for any magician but just how jason conquered the fear to do that uh trick and so he's taken to that story as well as what his his, his life is about so uh, so look at so that we're coming up on the top of the hour and uh i have a couple just uh i'm not we're not going to make this so we're not going to have a marathon session because i think this has been an unbelievably really good hour that we've had but i, I do we got it, but one more before we go i got to tell my story that didn't make it in your book the which story is that uh, uh, you're talking about the yeah, crazy uh, about the airport yes all right let me let me highlight you so that you can tell this story all right you're this the my favorite and and this is a story that i could not uh, I didn't tell Jason for quite a while because I didn't know how he was going to take it or anything. And at that time we were tired, but we were uh, actually leaving that Ethiopia uh, place. And for the first time in Ethiopia, we were going from there to Kuwait. And for the first time we were going to be on regular planes, not army planes or anything this time. We just have to take a, a regular flight over to there. And then we would be connected back with the, the U S military. So uh, our chart had left us. And we go, we had been up all night traveling. And then when we find out we're at one airport, we have to walk, you know, almost a half a mile over to this other airport with all of our luggage and everything. So we're going through water that deep. And uh, we get, we finally get over there. And the way they do things is you have to go up, you buy your ticket. And then they, they tell you how much your bags are. And you have to go to another window and pay for your bags while you stand there and wait and everybody else has to wait and then you come back and say here i paid for my bags and they put you on the plane 
when Jason does that and I'm standing there doing it and the lady behind the counter looks over and Jason is doing what we just saw on that video. Uh, and the, the, when he's really, really tired and just worn out, sometimes the, the, the ticks get worse. And uh, so he's putting on a show over there and I'm not paying attention. I'm tired. And this lady looks over there and she says, what's wrong with your friend? And I look over there and I don't, I, you know, I, I've been around Jason so much. I don't think about that anymore. I don't, you know, so I, I go nothing. We know we got to pay for the bags. He knows that. And she goes, Oh no, uh, there's something wrong with your friend. He can't fly. And I look again and then I see what she's talking about. And I go, no, no, it's Tourette's syndrome. And, it's, and, uh, I, and I'm trying to figure out how, how I'm an idiot. How am I going to explain Tourette's syndrome? And, um, she didn't know and she just said nope uh your friend can't fly i go oh no he has to fly we have to go we're with them so i'm trying to say we're with the military I'm, everything i can use to get them to go and she said one minute so she goes back to her boss and her boss i see him talking and looking and then he comes out and he goes sorry your friend can't fly and i and i go no you're not getting it it's up here it's one of these things and, and i'm trying to point to my brain thinking it's a brain thing it's what my mind's saying but i'm doing this i'm going there's something and you know it's in here and he goes oh you mean crazy and then he turned to her and he goes my brother-in-law's crazy crazy can fly <laughs> <laughs> I lost it. I was just like, oh, so I, I couldn't say anything like the Jason, like, hey, you be crazy for the next five, 20 minutes and stuff. And, and it, it, you know, I, but that was my, it should have been in the book. That's the, best part of, the best part of that story, Stephen, is when you, like, we were playing golf like six months or a year later before you even told me the story. I didn't even know that happened. And you're like, I'm gonna, you said to me, I'm going to tell you something, but I'm afraid to tell you because I think you might be mad. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite military story I couldn't tell. It was, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, all right. Okay. Let me do a, uh, uh, let me show you. Uh, we have a nice, uh, we have a couple of nice comments. You know, we've been getting some nice comments. And I think it's wonderful. Hey, Patty's watching and Derek's all watching. Hey. As well. That is very cool. Now, in my show, bumper Crazy. sticker. <laughs> great bumper sticker. <laughs> I like David Corsero's idea. Your my lecture notes could be called <laughs> Crazy Can Fly. <laughs> <laughs> Your next book could be Crazy Can Fly. I sure. like it. I like it. Absolutely. Now, in this show, when I first started this show, I decided I would do a small business spotlight and I wanted to spotlight yeah. my Ben Young, he's traveled with me as well. He's doing a live cast as well, and it's called Forever Young uh, with Ben Young. It's uh, quality online programming for all ages. It's basically a, I think I've watched it a couple of times. He's only done a couple of them, and they're usually about 30 minutes long. It's fast-paced uh, entertainment for both kids and parents to make them laugh, see some fun things, see some magic tricks, and meet some cool guests. Yesterday, he had Cameron Zavara on, who uh, was on a tour with Ben and I. Uh, and so Ben is doing a fun show, uh, and uh, and I think uh, I think it's great. So uh, one more, we're gonna do one more clip, and then we're gonna kind of wrap this up a little bit. This is uh, from. Tell us about this picture right here, Stephen. This is a picture from Cuba. Now, I was sick. Here's the worst part. I was so excited about going to um, Guantanamo Bay. I couldn't wait to get to Cuba. And as soon as we landed, I felt terrible. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Did I get, did I get air sickness? What happened was I got the flu. And basically for three days, I was laying in bed except for the show. So Stephen and Christian and Catalina went out and met with the soldiers. They did magic tricks for them. They did some tours. And the one thing I remember other than laying in that bed was the show. And you and Christian and Catalina both destroyed. I went first. I had to do 30 minutes. I had a sore throat. I could barely talk. And I was going, and I was like, get me off this stage. And then, uh, and then you, uh, you guys went up there and destroyed. Uh, tell us, tell us what that picture is right there. Yeah, this is, it's really can't hardly, hardly see it. Uh, but was uh, underneath there is where the Cuban uh, government accused the United States of stealing their water. 
And uh, so they were using it as propaganda, saying that the United States are down here and they're occupying part of this uh, island with, for their base, and they're, and they're stealing from us. So they were trying to get us out. So to prove that we wasn't, they dug out a big hole of the water pipe to show that it was not connected, that it was been disconnected so that we wasn't stealing their water and, and thing. They just left it uncovered to kind of show that uh, it was us proving that we didn't not doing what they uh, always everybody accuses us of doing. Right, exactly. All right, Stephen, you want to tell us, uh, is there anything you want to tell us about this clip we're getting ready to watch? This is from you performing a show. Here's the beautiful thing about what you do. Both but Nate is an unbelievable comedian and he's a clean comedian. And I think you can speak to this, but I think the reason he is clean is because you are a clean comedian too. And all that means is you don't use dirty words. You don't do things that are inappropriate on stage. You know how to be, you know how to push the envelope a little bit without ever making anybody so uncomfortable. They are, you know, covering their kids eyes up. So I want to show this clip so that they can see that you have, you can work for virtually any type of audience, family yeah. audiences, kids, adults. What are you, what are your thoughts? Well, on? Well, I think what they might need to know is uh, I started, I needed, I was doing corporate shows and different shows and sometimes there would be kids in the audience. And then I was doing family theaters and they're not always those kids, but sometimes those kids. And uh, there was always pressure to break, do something with the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so it, it takes it takes a while to be able to do what I'm doing here because it looks like I'm being really rough with the kid. And some people say, oh, he's being mean. But you got to look at the kid and you see that he's laughing and you see the, the what's happened, the play. For, I see this as play. I'm bringing a kid up and we're going to play and he's going to be a part of this show and I'm going to give him a chance to, to do something he's going to talk about hopefully for a long, long time. So uh, I'm going to say I hate him, but I don't. All right, here we go. How y'all doing? <laughs> I'm not from around here. <laughs> I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Wow, uh, just glad to be here. Just so you know, I, I, uh, I talk funny. It's not because I'm from Nashville. Or it's a little bit. No, what happened? Well, because I'm from Nashville. I already told the story. So. I, mean, I was bitten by a dog and uh, when I was young. and had I had like six and a half years of plastic surgery to kind of make sure we'll hands up. And, uh, what is going on here? Oh, oh, my goodness. Hold on. I don't know what I'm. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. It worked. <laughs> That's why they take skin from the other parts of your body and they rebuild your face. Six and a half years of surgery, true story. Most of my face is my butt. <laughs> it looks good, but I have bad breath a lot. <laughs> But it might get excited, you people might get wet. <laughs> I didn't know, the back of the back, I thought this was the adult kind of thing. I didn't know there was going to be kids in the audience. They didn't tell me that. God, I hate kids. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> Because this is what happened. We come out to the magic show. Somebody brought your kids, hoping that we get the little booger up here and do something with them or something. God, we hate doing that. <laughs> but if you don't, somebody will complain. And since I'm born at last act, we have to get a kid up here. Uh, we had a little girl up there. She's real cute. Let's get a little goofy boy. <laughs> Yeah, What's your name? Right. Big deal. <laughs> Did your dad even clap when that guy asked if you love your children? Did you look at that? <laughs> 
I would at least have a peek over there. Uh, did you say Craig? Craig? Craig. Craig. Okay, whatever you want. And uh, how old are you? Eleven. Big deal. When I was your age, I was 12. Lots more. I am way ahead of you. Here's what's going to happen, man. We're going to play a little game. You're going to lose. Is that all right? I'm going to be honest with you. Both magicians are not nice. I'm pretty nice. I'm letting you in. You're going to lose. You're not going to win. Can you handle that? And don't make you cry. I'm going to hate you. Don't cry. <laughs> you're, you're big enough not to cry. You're not going to cry. Don't cry. Think, play the game. Lose. Sit down like a man. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be really honest with you, though. You know, I'm going to call you my name. This is a chance to But I'm going to be honest. I know you're going to be great. I'm going to be told this every day. But a lot of old people, you later on, when they see you, they're not going to remember your name. They're going to go, oh, there's that loser. <laughs> old people wouldn't tell you that, but I'm telling you, I'm fine. Can you live with that? It could be a hard life for the family. All right? Here's the game. I got three wallets, number one, two, and three. Inside the material, I got a kid for some money. Just a dollar and just a kid. And, uh, but if you find it, it is no trick. You're going to win. But you're not going to find it. Because I know how your little pea brain works. <laughs> you think I'm old. You think old people can't remember things. So you think that since I'm old, I put the dollar in one, one. One help them remember where there's three wallets. <laughs> I could have put it in number three. If you were a girl, you would pick number two. All the girls pick number two. <laughs> now your little mind's all freaked out there, isn't it? You're going, oh, maybe he doesn't want me to take two, but the girl thing that got me, I'm not going to pick that. But I thought you don't know what to say. <laughs> but I'm just going to tell you, you're going to pick lose. Go sit down. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me, one, two, or three, loud voice, which one you want? Three. <laughs> you said two? Three. You said three. Yeah. No one's ever picked three. Except that one lady and she had a monkey with her. <laughs> I should have figured something was going to go wrong. What's in there? Take it out. See why I hate kids? I get out of here. <laughs> and you don't believe this. Inside number one, inside number two, I had $10 bills. Not so smart now, are you? <laughs> I know it's going to happen. Some, somebody out there got their feelings hurt. Oh, he was a little mean to the little boy or something like that. I, I always mess. I don't hate. Come back up. Wait, is that your family there? That other kid? I really don't care. Uh, <laughs> If you want to bring the other guy with you, I'm going to be nice. Come up. I'm going to give you guys a great chance real fast. You're not going to believe this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Magicians are not allowed to do this, but I am going to break all the rules. I am going to allow you to watch my next trick from behind. So that's it's like a lesson. You learn how all this trick is done by watching a magician in behind. All you do is stand right here. Put your hands behind your back so you don't be messing with all that other stuff. Figure out how that girl flies. <laughs> Not near as good from the back. But uh, don't move. Watch the trick. You'll know how it's done. Okay. Thank <laughs> guess. Thank you. He was getting on my nerves. <laughs> Guys, it 
was a lot of fun for me to uh <laughs> You guys don't know a joke when you hear one? <laughs> Oh, man, that's so much fun. Great time. Uh, David Miller from uh, Colorado. Captain yeah, absolutely. He, uh, Thank him for doing that. He uh, sent that video clip, and we really – you. I know it's it's great. It's great. It's absolutely great. So we're pretty much at the end of the, the – uh, we're pretty much at the end of the episode. Um, I've had a lot of fun uh, with you, and uh, today we uh, – we met Stephen Borgazzi, Nate's dad. Uh, heard some really good stories and laughed out loud at his uh, at his comedy and some of his some of his the stuff that he shared with us. Uh, we did not end up watching the video clip about imagination just because I think we were having so much fun talking and sharing stories. We'll get to that on episode number six. Uh, this uh, is your imagination. Maybe we that? did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In your imagination. Exactly. Um, and then there is, uh, we also, uh, like I said, we, we got to see some magic. Uh, and Or wait, did we even see magic? I don't even know if we saw yeah, magic. Yeah, we saw the, the, the wallet trick right there. Yeah, that's right. We saw magic, the, the wallet trick. So uh, was there anything that you wanted to uh, share as we wrap this bad boy up, Stephen? No, you know what? Uh, I think with this time and with everything, we, we got to be able to adapt to what's happening. We don't know what the, right now, what's going to happen. I hope that as soon as we can get back to live entertainment, anybody yeah. will, will op take us in open arms and that we can get back close as normal as we can. I know it might not ever be for the next, for a while, exactly normal, but uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to. In the meanwhile, we got to adapt. I have adapted. I've learned a new way of getting somebody to take a card. And so that I don't have to touch them. So, uh, so we have to be willing to adapt to this world and uh, and do things. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting back out and with a live audience. I know you are. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, guys, uh, we're wrapping up episode five. Uh, we'll be back with another episode soon. Uh, you can go ahead and sign up for that at uh, to to get the to get the notification at jasonmichaelsmagic.com forward slash jmtv. If you'd like a small business spotlight or uh, you have a story of overcoming an impossible challenge or a difficult situation, send me an email if you want to. I, I loved seeing the comments people made online. Uh, and uh, if you want to tell me what you thought of the episode privately, I don't know why you would, but if you do, feel free to email me that as well. JM at jasonmichaelsmagic.com. This has been episode number five. This has been a great time. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, this is us signing off and, uh, you guys take care of yourselves out there. Thanks, Jason.